Now, for, for anybody who was making a show for traditional TV, Netflix and other new services became kind of this second home and this second revenue source, and that's all great. Um, since you guys are trying all these different new models, I'm sure you'd like to think about after lives for some of this content, and maybe some of this content, Beatrice, in, in your case, is going to be on traditional TV. But can you get as far as thinking about that the same way that you know somebody who's making a show for a network can then think, great, I can find a, a secondary buyer for this, especially when the content lengths are different, and you know Netflix is going to have s specific requirements for how long shows need to be, and all that kind of stuff. Since there's no playbook written on it yet, you know you have the possibility to sort of do it yourself. So for us, again, it's an education process with the networks. We said, listen, our digital property will continue to live on MeToo, and you will have X amount of months or runs or years within the long form. And in the beginning, they were not very happy about the idea. They're like, wait a second, we don't want you guys sort of burning the content digitally that we're gonna have on TV. I'm like, well, you're looking at it in a really wrong way. What we are doing is promoting the long form content digitally and bringing audiences that if they wanna see more, if they like this, and then they can watch it on TV. And this is content that's complementary. So we're sort of like starting to experiment on with that. We our, our first show will launch at the end of October, so we don't know yet how successful that will be. We're hoping it will be, and it'll be a complement to whatever we have on TV that digital has sort of like a different feel. And we are creating it very, very differently. Obviously, we're not just putting together five-minute episodes, four of those into a half-an-hour show. We're creating a long form that is a television show and our short form content the way we want to engage our audiences so we're experimenting with that and networks are kind of open most of them to to trying it out so we still have those different windows um, if you may um, within short and long content so we are selling internationally some rights we are you know in the same way you would do even with short form and long form Zay can I ask you the same question yeah sure I, I mean I, I think that was a great answer and and um, you know, as you see bundling become harder to do and, and a lot of platforms sort of eschew the bundle, uh, and you also have the, the metaphor of time and place kind of crumble. It's not Thursday nights on NBC or 9 o'clock or 8 o'clock. You start to kind of divorce yourself from the notion of the hour, which then means that the division of these 22s becomes arbitrary. and. There starts to be a question. You had said Netflix having uh, content guidelines on length. Well, why? I mean, they can choose to, but there's no actual natural reason for it, except if you're talking about windowing into other spaces that have those kind of content limitations. And so I think that if, if your business is extraction, right, if you're trying to extract value out of talent over time, like, yeah, you're going to try to move to the norms that, that have... Uh, the most extraction capability. If you want to innovate in content and look at the future of form and think about new opportunities for like opening new marketplaces, um, I think that you a, a good question to ask is, you know, what is the minimum length that a traditional uh, screen, you know, scriptwriter could tell a compelling story. My guess it's actually like, you know, between nine and 12 pages is the sort of cut minimum where you could get a lot of the cliffhangers and characters, as Michael Schamberg likes to say. Uh, uh, and so that, you know, I, I'm very bullish on medium form scripted. I'm very bullish on, on uh, the notion of windowing and exclusivity actually getting separated. And the idea of having persistent free media also show up in a bunch of paid uh, or subscription spaces only to sort of complete the bundle. Um, so I, I, I'm really excited by it. I think this is a time where you have to challenge a lot of the assumptions around form. I think just generally we're a little too precious about form um, and that there's, a, there's still a lot of uh, opportunities to move in a lot of interesting spaces, whether it's you know in niche content or time shifts or whatever. Well, I, and I would imagine in, in a lot of ways, relationships still matter. I mean, Sev, for you in, let's say, dealing with Google, you know, which is not something traditional, you, you know, 
traditionally film producers would not be dealing with Google to, to get something made. Um, what did you learn through that process and, and does that sort of change your mindset on who you go to when you're actually going to try to get a film produced, made? No, that's a great point. Um, you know, what attracted me to Google was just that they have this huge global brand and, um, and I felt like that was on point, but you know, they, they are so set up for this kind of stuff. I mean, it just seems like it's untapped and you know, they have the resources, they have the talented individuals and the teams already in place. And um, no, I mean, I'm, I mean, I still want to work with them when we're talking and, but yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I think, like I said, I'm, I'm super open-minded and I think every filmmaker, emerging filmmaker should be. I think like, you know, all the innovations that we have today would have never been here had we not had the innovations from previous generations. And we owe it to all the previous filmmakers or content creators or technology specialists who gave us everything we have today. So we should never be closed-minded and only want to work in the traditional way just because that's what we're all used to.